G'day. Today is a small detour on the uh, bootstrapping a mill series because one thing that no one's mentioned yet is what happens if you haven't got something to hold the cutter. Well, you can make those. Uh, this project or this this particular device requires a lathe. Uh, there's a couple of flats on which you have to put on them with a file, but that's about it. So a little bit of screw cutting, a bit of tapered uh, boring, a bit of setting up to do a Morse taper. Um, but that's a that's a, an ER25 to uh, Morse taper three collet chuck. Now you still have to buy a nut to go on there, although you could make that, I guess. Uh, you still have to buy some collets, but. You know, it's something that, that, that uh, you don't necessarily have to buy. And it could also be that because of the dimensions of your, your mill, you may not be able to get something commercially that'll, that'll fit nicely. Uh, I've left the, the, the drawbar uh, thread untapped because it could be a half inch UNC, could be a half inch Whitworth, could be a, an M12. First thing I've got here is my stock. This is a bit of, uh, I think it's about like some 10, 50, uh, 40 or something like that, 1045 steel. Um, and that's just because it came off the scrap pile and I had a bit of paint on the end and so I've identified it. Doesn't particularly matter, uh, just needs to be you know, a lump of steel which you can put a thread on. I've got this dialed in on my four jaw chuck uh, and I hope people can see how dodgy this actually is. That's about 100 millimeters stick out and that's being held in by 15 millimeters worth of uh, material because that's the height of the jaws. Two ways I could do this. One is very carefully, slow speed, put a put a center in there and then use that to basically stabilize the, the material. The other thing I could use is a fixed steady. Uh, now I'm going to need a fixed steady on this anyway, so I may just uh, put that on. Two operations to do here. One is to take this down to uh, 32. It's, it's uh, 40 or 38, I uh, can't remember which one at the moment but take that down to 32 and I'll, I'll, I'll come right back to the chuck for reasons you'll see later. And then the next thing is to put on some uh, 32 by 1.5 thread here and that'll go back oh probably 13, 14 millimeters. I then need to put the steady back on, face off the end there and put in the hole and the uh, taper for the That's now down to size um, with a, an M32 by 1.5 thread on it, which matches the, the nut. I usually buy these nuts. Uh, they're, they're available on eBay. They're not terribly expensive. And there is a little trick eccentric in there, and I'll, I'll show you how that works in a moment. But you could, you could make it, um, but it's another one of those things that, that uh, well, you make one for experience perhaps, but uh, they're easier to uh, to buy. Mind you, so is a lot of this stuff, so mm, what am I saying? Uh, I've just machined the end here because that middle piece is going to be bored out, but I just wanted to make sure I had a, a square end to machine my thread to. It only needs to be uh, 13, 14 millimeters long because that's the depth before you run into the uh, the, the, the flange there, so that's all good and that, that, that actually screws on quite nicely. So that'll that'll go on quite well, and it's 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 quite a rarity that I, I do it to exactly as the as the thread table say, and it works first time. So you know, there you go. This is the the sort of spanner which is used to uh, put that nut on. Uh, as you can see, it's it's just you know four notches. Uh, so you could make one of these yourself if you if you wanted to. But once again, these are available reasonably cheaply on on eBay. So you know if you're going to order a nut, then you know, order one of these perhaps. Before I take the, the, the part out of the chuck and do work on the other end, 
I need to drill a clearance hole through there and then put a tapered bore in. The clearance hole is so that I can have stock sticking or a cutter sticking out of the back of, a, of the collet and the sides of that is 8 degrees, the side of that is, is 30 degrees and it always is that on ER collets. Once I have that hole I'll set my compound over to 8 degrees and then I'll just bore that out until the, the end of the cone is 25 which is the number that uh, RegioFix uh, recommend for the, for the hole. That's this end done on the lathe. So I've got my external thread there. I've got a clearance hole with an eight millimeter, with an eight degree um, slope on it. So that sits there just nicely. The way, for those who are not familiar with the uh, collets, the, there's there's an eccentric in there, and what you do is you actually clip that into that groove around the collet. And so what that means is it it, it sort of helps eject the thing when you when you're done. So I can put that in there. That'll wedge up on that eight degree face, lock everything up, and then when I want to undo it all, I apply my spanner, and because it's got that groove there, that'll, that'll pull that out. The alternative is you get a, a, a collet which might be stuck in that taper. So, handy thing to have. Um, as I said, you could make those, but it's a little bit tricky. Um, so, you know, it's, it's your call, it's your call. Right, so this is all done. Now, in order for this to actually hold something, I either need to put some flats on the, on the, on the top of the uh, part here, either side so I can get a spanner on there, or I could put some holes in there for a pin wrench. Once again, it's, it's, it's your choice. Um, I'm going to go for flats, but uh, that's, that's just because I can. Uh, and if you're doing this without a mill, you may have to... Um, uh, relieve a little bit of that material away and then go in there with a file and try and get the best you can with a file. I have my blank sitting in, in the, the uh, T-slot of my mill uh, and that's just because it's a convenient spot with a T-slot in it. I could use a V-block if I had a V-block which I just happened to make. I'm assuming you can't flatten that off until you can hold the cutter so you know that's a bit of a chicken and egg there. However, what I've done is I've, I've, I've measured to the top there, which is 32. Um, well, that's diameter 32, but in the V-block it's down a little bit. I've then gone in two millimeters because I want a 28 flat. So this, I've, I've, I've put, scribed two lines. I've scribed one there, and then without moving this part, come round and scribe the other side. And that shows me where the flat has to be. So what I'll do is I'll get a, um, a file out and I'll file that down. It shouldn't take long because it's I'm only going in a little bit. There's my first flat. I just put that on with a, uh, a square file. Nothing, nothing terribly difficult there. Uh, file down to my marks and I also had a mark here just to, to keep that away from the thread. I'm now going to use a bit of uh, what's that half inch tool steel. I'll just sit that on there like so do the same sort of thing, mark the, the sides, file down, and uh, I'll have my two flats. This is the progress so far. I've got my tapered bore in there for the collet, I've got the thread on there for the nut, and I've got two flats on there. Now, this is where we start getting a bit cunning. I could chuck that up, put that in the forge, or clean that up, all that sort of stuff, and I'd get a result. But what I'm going to do is I've got a bit of 16 millimeter bar here. Uh, this is bright finish and that's what you what you do need. But what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put a collet nut on there and put that on there like so. And what that will do once I've got that tightened up it should mean that that piece of bar which I've clocked up and is is, is concentric to within, well, very little, a few thou, few, sorry, a few tenths for thou. Um, I can then come along, I can put a centre in the back of that, I can take this down to size in preparation for my, my taper turning. Some of you may be asking, why make it this way? Is there another way to do it? Well, yes, there is. If I'd started by putting on a 
uh, number three Morton here, right? I could have gone to this. This is an adapter collar uh, that I made up for my lathe some time ago, but the inside is, is Morse 3 and the outside I think is Jarno something or other, uh, but that fits in the headstock. So what I could have done was got the Morse 3 in there, put a, um, a draw bar on the back there to hold it in, and then I could have used that to get it concentric to and, and do the collet details. That's if you've got one of these. These are one of those parts that go missing off on a lathe quite often, and so this is probably the safer bet. Uh, similarly, if you've got a small lathe, that's why I've been using it in the fore jaw here without actually going into the, the chuck very much, uh, because you may not be able to fit a bit of 32 bar into your fore jaw, depending on the size of your lathe. On this lathe, I've got a taper turning attachment, and so turning tapers is, is pretty straightforward once I, I set all that up. Uh, and the way I normally do that there is either a variation of this or I put a known taper in there and set that over until I get a you know a zero reading on here. Because I'm trying to do this as low low tech as I can, I'm doing it the uh, the harder way. I've got a, a long stroke indicator here set up and I've, I'm just using that because I've, I've got it uh, and that's that'll read up to 30 millimeters. Now the taper on a Morse uh, number three is, I think it's 51 thou per inch. That's 51 thou on both sides. So I need to get this indicator moving 25 thou for an inch of travel or 25.4 millimeters of travel. And so that's a little bit of playing around with the, with the compound here. The added thing is that this isn't going to uh, be long enough. I've got 76 millimeters, three inches worth of play on my compound and I need 81 millimeters for the taper and so what I'm going to have to do there is once I've got everything set up I can cut most of the taper and then I'm going to have to um, move along and try and pick up and you know fudge that a bit that's not actually as bad as it sounds. Some tapers have got uh, a gap in the middle there, so you've got a front and a back. But really, as long as this bit, uh, you know, engages in the in the in the in the taper on the machine, and you've got a draw bar pulling from there, you're pretty right. Uh, you want to try and get this as close to the proper taper as you can because that gives you a nice fit. It doesn't doesn't jump around a bit. But if this is a little bit short it's not going to matter and so another option might be is you you put as much taper on as you can and then you just machine this bit down to you know the the the, the minor diameter the small diameter or something like that and have a have a step there this is a picture uh, of a of a taper with a tang on it and i, I printed this out because it gave me some information both in imperial and metric uh, i'm not concerned about the tang but what i want to point out is there is a thing called a gauge line on these tapers so the taper doesn't go all the way up to there. Uh, well, it, it, it can continue up to there, but the taper is measured at the gauge line at a diameter. So what I've done here is I've turned this cylindrical part here to that gauge diameter. I'm actually going to start my taper a little bit back from the, the, uh, the corner here to give myself a little bit of room, and then I'm going to you know, bring that down. I've already started roughing that out a little bit. The other thing worth noting is is the um, the crank on my compound here. A lot of these things have just got the single crank and you crank it like that. Now when you're doing that you're not getting uniform motion. Okay, so this is actually quite nice and I'd advise anybody who's who's got a, a single crank uh, compound like this is that if they want to do Tape work and be able to wind this thing um, smoothly. If you do a double handle like that, what I find I can do is I can do that, and that is far easier to keep a constant speed. I cleared some material off the back half here and then put a texture mark there and came in with my cutter and the edge of the texture is effectively my gauge line. Okay, so from, from the edge of the texture that way is uh, cylindrical, 
from here down it tapers now as I predicted I've run out of room down here I've, I'm, I'm a little bit short I need to check what the length from there to there is because that needs to be 81 millimeters and I may end up taking something off that but in the meantime I need to finish that taper now what I'm going to do to do that is bring my carriage down I've wound the, the I've, I've, I've gone as far as I can I've wound this back a little bit I'm going to bring my carriage here and then wind that in till that just touches the texture that texture is going to be a poof tenth of an inch thick right not very thick at all so if I get it so it just scrapes just takes off a, a, a little bit of the color I can I should be able to wind down and that will match pretty well and if it doesn't it's going to be just slightly undersized right which won't worry me because as I said um, as long as this bits a good fit and I can pull from here I'm good There's the finished result. Uh, I've given that a bit of a polish with some emery to try and get some of my tool marks out of it. When I um, put some whiteboard marker on there and then run the sleeve over the top uh, where I had to re-engage, you can see there's a little bit of stuff there but I've got good contact there, reasonable contact there, reasonable contact there uh, and some through here so it's you know, it's reasonably uniform. There's still a bit of a high spot there I think but it's you know when you when you try that on that's that's quite quite solid so I don't think there's a problem there so there we go there's a there's a bit of tooling for the mill thanks for watching see you for the next one